Podcast. I am Pastor Alex Bruning of First United Methodist Church in Jessup, Iowa, and this is Thursday Thoughts. I'm here to offer you my thoughts this week on the book of Ruth as we continue our look at the five forgotten books of the Bible um, with the help of Dr. Robert Williamson, Jr. So um, we spent the last two weeks looking at Song of Songs. If you missed any of that, you can catch all of it on our YouTube page. So you can catch our two sermons on that, our Thursday Thoughts on Song of Songs, and our Woman Wednesday on Song of Songs. Just check back in our videos. And now we're moving on to our second book, on to Ruth. Now, Ruth is probably the least forgotten, I think, of the forgotten books of the Bible. Um, I especially think there's one section of Ruth that is really prominent, which is Ruth is Ruth's speech to Naomi, pledging her loyalty, where you go, I will go. Um, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. Um, it's actually a really common text read at weddings. It was in no way intended um, for romantic love. Um, it was a pledge of commitment um, to her mother-in-law. And um, so I do think Ruth, least forgotten of the forgotten books, but I want to cover Ruth uh, here in this Thursday Thoughts video. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background information on Ruth. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the story that you find in the book of Ruth. And then I'm going to offer a few discussion questions that came up uh, from Dr. Robert Williamson Jr.'s work and also in my reading of Ruth. So let's start with when Ruth was written. Let's set the scene a little bit. So in the beginning of the book, we hear that Ruth took place in the time of the judges. So this would be the time between uh, between the Exodus and um, the rule of the monarchy. So for a really long time, there were judges in place that helped keep things in order and running smoothly. Throughout this time, the people were begging for a king, um, and God kept giving more and more judges until eventually God gave in and gave them a king, and things didn't go well, right? Uh, or at least some parts of it didn't go well. So this is supposedly taking place in the time of the judges, the story itself. However, it's believed that the book itself was written at a much later date. It's believed that it was probably written around the 5th century BCE. Uh, one of the, the common possibilities for when this was written and why it was written was during a period of Persian rule when uh, Judean deportees, so they had they had been exiled from their land, were actually coming back into Judah at this time and reestablishing themselves within this community. We learn about this time in particular in Ezra and Nehemiah. And in both Ezra and Nehemiah, when people are reestablishing themselves, when Judeans are coming back and reestablishing establishing themselves in the region of Judah, there are issues. There are tons of problems going on. And in both Ezra and Nehemiah, all of those problems are blamed on foreigners who are coming back in with the Judean people. So while they were in exile, Judeans began to intermarry with people outside of the tribe of Israel. Um, particularly in Ruth, we're looking at the Moabites. Um, which are kind of seen as the worst of worst in terms of anti-immigrant thought. So both Ezra and Nehemiah blame the woes on the presence of immigrants. And Ezra closes with the deportation of all foreign wives and their children. This would have included Ruth um, had Ruth been in the time period of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so Ezra closes with kind of an ethnic purification. They deported all of the wives and children. The men agreed to let them be deported uh, so that there wouldn't be any more problems because all of the problems were blamed on the immigrants to the region of Judah. And in order to correct this anti-immigrant thought, which was wrong, Ruth was written. Ruth was written to show people the error in their anti-immigrant thought. Ruth was a Moabite, the worst of worst when it came to anti-immigrant thought. So um, in Ezra and Nehemiah, um, Moabites were, the, were seen as the worst kind of immigrants. And Ruth is a Moabite woman uh, who actually saves the Davidic line. So you find out uh, towards the end of the book of Ruth, actually the very end of the book of Ruth, that 
Ruth's son, Obed, becomes Jesse's father, who is David's father. So we find out that without Ruth the Moabite, there would be no line of David. There would be no great Davidic kingdom. There would be no great Israel again uh, without Ruth the Moabite. So it's believed that the story of Ruth was was written and told in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah to help uh, the people understand that they should not fear immigrants, that they should not blame immigrants for things that are going wrong, but rather that the greatness of Israel is built on immigrants and on um, their bloodlines as well. That without immigrants, there could be no David. Without immigrants, there could be no great kingdom of Israel. And if we continue on down that lineage, I mean, centuries later, we see that there could be no Jesus without Ruth the Moabite, who is in the lineage of Jesus that we hear um, in the Gospels. So Ruth, the story of Ruth, is meant to help the people understand the importance of immigrants and foreigners in um, building up a community and in um, life together. So some of you might know the story of Ruth, or at least kind of the basic overarch of Ruth, but I'm going to cover it here again, just in case you don't remember, or as a little refresher, or in case you've never heard the story of Ruth, because it is a forgotten book of the Bible, right? Or maybe you just forgot it. So um, in the beginning of Ruth, we hear about Eli Malik and his wife, Naomi, and their family. Eli Malik and Naomi um, live in Jerusalem in a time where there is famine. So they decide to leave the region, uh, essentially becoming refugees, to go and find somewhere else where there is food for their family. So they go and they establish themselves um, in another location, in a foreign location, where there is food. And they live there for several years. They raise their sons there. Their sons then marry um, foreign women, Moabite women, they marry Ruth, who we hear a lot about, who the book is named after, and Orpah, who we don't really hear a lot about. Uh, after some time of marriage and time in this foreign land, uh, Eli Melek dies, um, leaving Naomi a widow. And shortly after that, shortly after that, um, both of Naomi's sons die as well. Um, and so that leaves not only Naomi widowed and childless, but it leaves Ruth and Orpah also widowed and childless. And this time um, period, being widowed and childless is about the worst of the worst um, because your stability, your life, your security, your food, your money, everything depends on the male. And without any male descendants, there's nobody to care for you. So Ruth, I mean, I'm sorry, Naomi, Naomi has heard that um, God has looked upon Jerusalem with favor again, and um, that there's food again. And so she decides that she is going to journey back home. And she tells Naomi and Orpah that they need to stay there, that they need to go back to their mother's homes, um, that she has nothing for them. I have no more kids for you. I'm too old to marry. I'm not going to have any more kids. Even if I did have more kids, would you wait to marry them for 20 years? Probably not 20, but, you know. Um, and so she tells them, just stay here. Stay with your mother. Go back to your mother's house. Um, and and be here where somebody can offer you protection and security and food and all of those things. So initially, both Ruth and Orpa say, no, I'm staying with you. We're going with you. We're coming with you. But Naomi says, no, 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 and tells them again, you're staying here. Orpa agrees to stay and go back to her mother's house. But she does so very tearfully, very upset, hugging Naomi, kissing Naomi, not wanting to leave her mother-in-law. And Ruth says, we then have her famous speech where Ruth says, no, I'm going with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I am forever loyal and committed to you. In fact, the the word that Ruth uses in this famous speech, cling, she she's clung to Naomi, is the same word used in Genesis 2, 24, describing a man clinging to his wife. So she says, I am, I am deep, lifelong committed to you. 
So Ruth and Naomi set out. Again, refugees traveling, um, trying to find food. And they arrived back in um, Naomi's hometown. And um, when they arrived back there, Naomi is is welcomed and they just kind of ignore Ruth and pretend that Ruth isn't even with her, that they don't even see this foreign woman standing there. And, uh, so they're back. Um, they have no male to support them. They really don't know what they're going to do. And so Ruth says, I'm going to go glean from the fields, which is totally legal and acceptable, um, for widowers, orphans, and immigrants to do, to go and pick up what is left after a field is harvested. So Ruth ends up in the field of Boaz, who actually is relation to Naomi, kind of distantly, but still related. And Boaz kind of takes favor upon Ruth and brings her into the fold of his female servants, allowing her to eat with them, um, protecting her like he, like she's one of his female servants, telling the men not to touch her, um, sending extra food home for Naomi, um, and just kind of finds favor with her. He says, I know of you. I know that um, you have been loyal and committed to Naomi, and I find that to be impressive. And so he kind of takes care of her. Well, she goes back to Naomi and Naomi says, oh, Boaz, he can be our redeemer, which is a, is a legal term in this time. So we find out that Naomi has a small patch of land that belonged to Eli Melek's line and a redeemer can purchase that land um, and then Naomi would be able to live off of the money. And a redeemer is usually a close male relative who would purchase the land until such time that the family could buy it back from them or the year of Jubilee came where all land was returned to its original owners. So Boaz um, could be their redeemer, Naomi says. Naomi then comes up with a plan to marry Ruth off to Boaz so that Boaz can care for Ruth. And um, so Naomi tells Ruth to go once um, Boaz is drunk to the threshing floor and to lay at his feet. All kinds of sexual innuendos there are believed. Um, we don't really know for sure. Either way, it's kind of, okay, go and undress in front of him and lay at his actual feet or go and undress him because feet is sometimes a euphemism for male genitalia. So um, Ruth goes and presents herself um, to um, Boaz in some form. We're not sure. And Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night and it says, why are you here? What's going on? Who are you? What happened? And Ruth says, I want you to marry me and to be Naomi's redeemer. So two separate things. I want you to be my husband and I want you to redeem Naomi so that we're both brought into your household and you are our protector. Boaz agrees to this. However, there is a closer male relative to Naomi who actually has the first rights to being the redeemer. So unless he passes on those rights, Boaz cannot redeem Naomi. He could marry Ruth, but he could not redeem Naomi. So we fast forward a little and we're in the town square and Boaz has brought the other man who is a closer relation to Naomi um, and said to him, Naomi needs a redeemer. You can be her redeemer. And the guy's like, yeah, this is a great deal. Um, Naomi is widowed and childless. So I'm going to get to keep her land. There's not going to be anybody for me to give it back to at the year of Jubilee and nobody to buy it back. So me and my sons are going to get more land. Why wouldn't I take you up on this deal to be her redeemer? But then Boaz kind of throws a little monkey wrench in it and says, however, you can redeem Naomi, but I am going to marry Ruth and I'm dedicating my first child to Eli Malik's family line, which means that there would be somebody to take the land back. So it's no longer such a great deal. And the other gentleman, what's his name, is kind of how it's, or what's his face, is kind of a what it would be translated as. Um, what's his face says, never mind, I don't want that deal. Go ahead, you redeem Naomi. So Boaz, in that instant, becomes Naomi's redeemer and marries Ruth, not in that instant, but 
that's what goes on to happen. Um, and so he has um, brought them both into his home. He is going to be their protector and their provider. And Ruth has not only stayed true to her loyalty to Naomi, but she has made it possible for Naomi and her own survival through her marriage and redemption through Boaz. The story goes on to say that Boaz and Ruth do bear a child, Obed, and um, Naomi and the women of Jerusalem are thrilled. They pray a blessing upon this child, and they tell Naomi that Ruth is better than seven sons that you might have come here empty without sons, but Ruth has been more loyal than seven sons ever could be. And then we find out that Obed is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. So through Ruth, the Moabite, and her loyalty to Naomi, the Israelite, um, and through her intermarriage to Boaz, an Israelite, the line of David is able to be possible. Woo! So that is the story of Ruth, very quickly told. Um, and I, I think it's important to highlight that this intermarriage that took place is the very intermarriage that um, Ezra and Nehemiah stood against. This intermarriage is the very intermarriage that not only did Ezra and Nehemiah stand against, but Ezra and Nehemiah would have separated, would have um, deported Ruth. Um, and this very marriage that Ezra and Nehemiah stood against is the very marriage that allows for the line of David. It's the very marriage that allows for the great Davidic kingdom. It's the very marriage that allows for all of the prophecies um, to be fulfilled later on through the birth of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. So um, it's very interesting uh, that this is a story that took place in the time of Judges, but it wasn't a story that anyone felt the need to tell until the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, until it came to a point where anti-immigrant thought was so high that they failed to see how the immigrant community um, is what made the nation of Israel great to begin with and what would continue to make the nation of Israel great. What are your thoughts? What are your comments? What are your questions? Put them down below. I'd love to respond to you. I have a couple of thoughts and discussion questions that I'd like to talk about. So um, one is about children. So in this time, um, Naomi comes from a culture that doesn't necessarily believe in a literal afterlife. So what you leave, your legacy, your continued connection to the community Israel was through your children. Without the birth of children, your family line died and it was as if you never existed at all. It was as if you were never a part of the community of Israel. Um, and so for for Naomi, when she lost not only her husband and her children, it wasn't just the loss of beloved family members. It was the loss of community. It was the loss of a relationship with the people Israel. And that was a, a very hard thing for her. Now, while we believe in an afterlife as followers of Jesus Christ, I'm Think about what we leave on earth when we do die and how that carries on community, how that carries on a legacy, and what that wants to look like. Now, I don't believe that it's necessarily through our blood children or through the children we raise, but through the relationships that we establish in our time here on earth and how those people establish relationships and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think too, the story does remind us of the importance of relationships, of community, of making sure that we are connected to the community, that we are living the love and grace of God in the community so that the love and grace of God not only is lived out through me and my relationships, but through relationships of the people I have relationships with and so on and so forth. Just something I thought about. Um, I really love Ruth's famous speech um, to Naomi. And I'm 
I know it's read at weddings and, and sometimes people take um, issue with that. I don't know if I do or not. I love that the word in there is the same word as in Genesis 2, 24, when it talks about a man clinging to his wife. Ruth clung to Naomi in this way, deep, lifelong, committed love. And I think that deep, lifelong, committed love should be the foundation of a marriage. It shouldn't necessarily be romantic love, but deep, lifelong, committed love. And I also think that deep, lifelong, committed love comes not only in romantic relationships, but also in friendships as well. And I think maybe what we look at as, you know, family isn't isn't always blood. It's who sticks beside you. It's who's there for you when you need the most. It's the people that you can count on. So I just, I invite you to think about who, who in your life clings to you in deep, lifelong, committed love. Who do you have that love and that loyalty with the way Ruth and Naomi did? Who are you deep, lifelong, committed to? Um, who are you clinging to? Um, and, and how are you making sure to live into that clinging, to that loyalty, to that love and commitment? Um, and have you ever told those people in your life, hey, I am in this deep, lifelong, committed love. Um, I am your Ruth. You are my Naomi. I'm sticking with you. Um, and maybe you haven't used those words. Maybe you've just done it by example of how you live in your action. But um, perhaps straight up telling them that too would be awesome. Um, to have somebody say that to you, um, to know that. Um, I think can be a very powerful, um, our actions do speak, but sometimes it's nice for our words to speak too. So my one last kind of thinking discussion kind of point here, Naomi, the name itself, uh, literally means pleasantness. However, when she returns um, to Jerusalem, having lost her husband and her sons, she tells everyone to call her Mara, which means bitterness. She feels as if she's been cursed, as if God is absent from her life and God has cursed her, that God is nowhere to be found. So she's no longer pleasant, but bitter. And I just wonder when you felt this way, when have you felt like you've gone from pleasant to bitter and how did that look what did that look like how did that happen did you feel that god was absent did you feel god was cursing you are you still in that place or did you come out of that place um at the end of the book of ruth naomi's life is filled again um she has ruth she has boaz she has obed this this beautiful baby um who will carry on her family line uh forever and no longer does she feel God is is absent, but God has has blessed her with Obed. So at what point did you come out of that feeling? What made you come out of that feeling? What blessing did you see that helped you realize God wasn't absent? Do you still now, having been through the experience, feel God was absent during that time? Um, or do you see now the workings of God in that time? Um, it just took some hindsight to see. I don't know. I'm just kind of interested in that um, and thoughts of that. So if you want to share your your pleasantness to bitterness moments or your bitterness to pleasantness moments, um, I'd love to hear them. Give me a call. We can chat or you can email or you can comment them below. So that is our rundown of Ruth. We will be preaching on Ruth this Sunday. Um, the 21st will be our first week on Ruth. And then next Wednesday, which will be 22nd, 23rd, 24th, Wednesday the 24th, you'll find a Woman Wednesday um, related to Ruth. And then on Sunday the 28th, you'll find our second sermon on the book of Ruth before we enter into Lamentations, our third forgotten book. Thank you for joining me for my thoughts on this Thursday, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, so comment them down below. Thanks, friends.